things, mahis, so I'm, I'm not really going to blame the moon on it here. I just think we're in a, a phase with the current that we have. It's kind of slowed down the pelagic bite. There's a lot of current, and if you can get out of some of that current, I think you'll have some better action if you're going to fish this weekend. Getting into bottom fishing, um, we'll start right from the get-go, a tackle. Um, I use a 50 to 80 pound stand-up boat rod for our grouper fishing, and I use this same rod for mutton fishing. It's 6'6". Six, six. Um, we use the Pentorg 30. It's a two-speed reel, carries a tremendous amount of drag, uh, more than we can use uh, with the type of fishing we're doing. But the nice thing about it is it is two-speed. Um, you have times where you can't turn the handle or you have your wife with you or kids with you or dad with you or whatever the case may be, going into low gear without having to pump, you can just sit there and turn the handle. And that is, you know, an advantage that you need to have a lot of times when, when hooking into bigger fish. It's just being able to get them away from the bottom, not let them turn their head back in the bottom. So I always try to fish in high gear to start until I figure out, uh, you know, the clients that I'm dealing with and we'll go to low gear uh, if we have to. Obviously it's a lot slower getting them away, but if I'm not anchored up, I can also use the boat to kind of bump the fish away while they're cranking to help get a, a little head start off the bottom. Um, I fish 100 pound braid. The blue camo spider wire uh, is what I use on everything. We use 65 pound on the spinning outfits um, and I use 100 pound on the, uh, the grouper rods and our, our heavier snapper rods. Um, I also use the 65 pound for daytime sword fishing. So it's multi multifaceted. Um, to that, <laughs> we'll go to a three-way swivel, um, and it's two barrel swivels wrapped around each other, and I, I tie the, uh, the braid straight to it, and coming off of the swivel where your braid is tied to, you have a drop with just a surgeon's loop, and uh, you know, what kind of conditions we're dealing with and what we're targeting in all honesty. Um, typically when I'm grouper fishing, I'll start out with heavier leader. I'll start out with buck and a quarter. Um, and I typically fish a 10 foot leader to get started, eight to 10 foot. And the reason why I start heavy is I wanna see if I can get bites. And if I can get bites on a heavy leader, then I, I feel like I have a greater advantage than if I just 60 or 80 pound, right? If I start with 60 or 80 pound and I get a few bites and I break a few fish off, I'm gonna shut the spot off. One, if, you, if you've done much bottom fishing, if you lose a couple fish, if you break a couple fish off, just because they're free from your rod doesn't mean they're not, you know, hung up in the reef where they cut the leader and not down there flailing around. But fish, fish are keen. You know, we, we, I, I think they get lead shy at times. I talk about it um, with a lot of my commercial buddies. I think when losing a couple fish in the bottom, catching a few fish, obviously can slow your bite down. It's not necessarily a bad thing in my opinion because. Uh, you get on a really good bite on one spot, you don't want to clean the spot out. I think that's one of the biggest issues that people have with spots that don't last a long time is they go back to the same spot every day uh, that they fish and they'll kill everything that they can. Um, you know, if we could catch a couple fish off of a spot and then catch a couple more fish off of a spot 200 yards away, I feel better about it than wiping out the rock. Um, I have noticed too, when you see uh, a large number of groupers, something like we would call a aggregation, where they're all uh, aggregated together for a spawn. If you catch, if you catch the queen bee, so to speak, on the first drop or two, things deteriorate pretty rapidly. Um, as far as the rest of the fish biting, in my experience, so some of the things to take into consideration um, when when you are fishing is is kind of trying to. Preserve the spot when you do find a good spot, not beat it up every day, not stay there for hours on end. Catch a few fish, leave. You can come back in the afternoon if you want to try to catch a few more if you didn't, but I wouldn't sit there and 15 fish off of one spot, especially if it's a small area, it's gonna shut you down. Um, we start with the heavier leader again, 10 foot. Uh, today, we could not get bites on the heavier leader grouper fishing. So my next step, uh, when I have fish a 10 foot leader on buck and a quarter is to lengthen it before I go to down. Hear me? Okay. Um, I go to lengthen the leader. So we went up to 17 or 18 foot a leader to see if we could get a bite. 
two guys stand on the rod with buck and a quarter all day waiting for the one big bite, right? So um, everybody was fishing 80 pound, two guys at a time, and we were rotating with the four guys. And everybody was getting bites. Well, all of a sudden, you know, we get a, a, a quality fish bite, and it, it was just too much. Um, it was too much for the leader and the, the tackle that we had. Um, and, and we ended up parting the leader a couple times on the fish. So there, there is a double-edged sword. If you're patient and you feel like you're marking a spot and you feel like you can wait out a bite because you're not charter fishing and you're out there recreationally doing it, stay with the heavier leader. Try keeping it lengthened and uh, see if that works to your advantage. But in my opinion, as opposed to hooking a fish in the corner of the mouth, if I hook him in the gut, to me, he's not going to fight as hard. So it gives my angler a better chance. It's a kind of a sad way to approach the current scenario that we have right now with sharks. But it's a transition I've made. Um, you know, we, we, we don't hook a tremendous amount of fish in the gut, but there are certainly uh, a, a number of them, unfortunately, that, that get hooked in the gut. And obviously stuff we're going to keep, we don't care about. Um, but I also, too, when we do that, you know, we, we leave the hook with the fish. I don't try to dig in there and dig it out of its stomach or whatever. I feel like it's got a better chance um, of surviving without, without doing that population. Um, so <clears throat> on our live bait stuff for, uh, for grouper fishing, we're fishing a uh, Mustad Ultra Point. It's a 9174 black nickel hook, and this is a 10 knot that we fish for our live baits. Okay? This is going to be anything from a bait that's three inches long to two pounds, a blue runner or small grunt, whatever the case may be, a pilchard. We're targeting the bigger fish. Um, a little bit different than uh, what I talk about with pelagic fishing, where it's easier to hook a, a big fish on a small hook, or easier to catch a big fish than a small fish on a big hook. The reason why that is, if you're fishing 20 pound for mahis or sails, and you've got a 12 aught hook out there and a big bait, you don't have enough drag to penetrate that hook. Well, we're fishing 25 to 30 pounds of drag here. So this hook and this bar, when we get the bite, can go through that fish and penetrate that fish's jawbone or the corner of his mouth or his lips or whatever the case may be. So it's a little bit of a different scenario um, and I, hopefully that makes sense to you guys. Use on any of our other that we would use. Pinfish, grunts, blue runners, uh, can't say snapper because I'm on Facebook Live, but uh, <laughs> so any of the, any of the non-scale baits, uh, we would use the, the larger size hook. Um, as far as hooking the baits, uh, just like surface fishing with a live bait, any of the pelagics, uh, when we're bump trolling or I'm drifting with flat lines when I'm kite fishing, everything's hooked through the clear cartilage in front of the eyes and the hook is sideways, okay? When we do our grunts, our pinfish, our pigfish, our blue runners, croakers, uh, whatever the case may be, the hook goes up through the lower jaw and out the top, so you have both lips and that, that fish is pretty heavily secured on there um, for a bite. Uh, once we've got our bait and we've got our rig set up and we, uh, we start fishing, um, I'll have my guys drop simultaneously if we're power fishing. And when we get down to the bottom, I always tell everybody if you're gonna hold the rod, which I recommend, um, you're gonna want your left hand above the reel for leverage. Your drag, of course, pushed all the way up. And I like to keep my rod tip up at eye level. I see a lot of people that wanna put it down here. And the biggest problem with this that I see is if you get bit and your rod is low and you get yanked down, you are at a distinct disadvantage. You have no leverage to pull up. You're kind of pinned, right? So you, all you've got is turning the handle. Well, if all you got is turning the handle and you're in high gear on a two-speed reel or you've got a reel that doesn't have low gear, you're done. You can't turn the handle. It's very challenging, very difficult, right? So if you fish in high gear and you have your rod tip up and with the braid, you can feel your bait getting nervous. I like, I like people to just kind of slowly crank their rod down to the water and then lift up again. And you're kind of teasing that bait up away when he's nervous from the fish. Try to get off the bottom even a little bit more to give yourself an advantage, right? When you start to get that bite and you get bit, you just start turning the handle, okay? Crank, don't yank is a saying I use on the boat to try to get into people's heads. And it's, it's hard to do because a lot of people like to set the hook. Up most likely away from the, the snapper or the grouper that 
if you go to set the hook, you're just yanking on the lead and you're not applying direct pressure to the fish. So what's the best thing to do to eliminate this angle? It's just a crank, right? So if you crank and come tight, then the angle's eliminated as quickly as possible, quicker than setting the hook. Plus, you don't have a pound of lead potentially in between you and the hook set, right? So I see a lot of people set the hook and they, they, they hook the fish and the first thing I say is, man, I hope he stays on, right? And a lot of hook, if that makes sense. So when you feel your bite, if your rod tips up high and you're not teasing up, it's kind of, it can just be a slammer bite. You're at a good power position. One thing that I really like to try to do, conditions where a current has your bait stretched out on the bottom, is they're gonna bite, bite, bite the bait, they're gonna bite the bait, and then your rod's gonna load up and stay loaded up and when that happens you just crank on it right in the rod holder <clears throat> what we're doing when the sharks and goliaths aren't bad we're just fishing a three-way swivel i have the people crank this lead to the surface i hand it to them and then we hand line the fish up the rest of the way um, when the goliath groupers have been bad or the sharks have been bad um, we've rigged a uh, inline swivel which is called made by a company called spro they're really small barrel swivels that we use for tuna fishing uh, that are 80 pound in strength. And what we do is we put one of these uh, beads on the leader between two swivels, okay? So I have a barrel swivel where my main line connection is to the start of my 50 foot leader. And on the mono, not on the braid, is the bead. My bank sinker is above the spro swivel and what I do is I take a rubber band and I secure everything there with a rigging rubber band that breaks when it hits the rod tip. And what happens is when this hits the rod tip as you're cranking up, the swivel and the lead, I'm sorry, the bead and the lead break free and slide 50 feet down the leader. Now I've got another spro swivel that's about two feet in front of the bait and the bead now this time is on the rod tip side of the swivel. If you can visualize it, it slides down, the bead hits the swivel, the lead stops on the bead so it doesn't slide to the hook to dehook the fish. So if you're in an area where goliath groupers are bad, um, which is common down off the Loran Tower, if you fish any wrecks or FPL or any of these uh, high relief areas or big public spots, um, it's common to have, inter have goliath groupers interrupt your fishing. And one of the things that we've found is being able to continuously crank in high gear without any interruption of pausing and passing the lead and then there you go yeah i think so um if you have wet hands or you just you were cutting a bait for another rod right you got fish slime on your hands now your one rod goes off and your buddy's cranking it up and you try to hand line and you're just slipping with the 30 or 40 or 50 pound leader that you're using and all of a sudden those fish take advantage of that the sharks do and the uh the goliath groupers do now i haven't done it yet but my plan uh when i when i get anchored up mutton fishing next time that we start to have shark problems is when i'm fishing with that rig attached to that rig is going to be the zeppelin and when the zeppelin and the lead slide down the zeppelin is going to be on a drop and what i mean by that is just a long piece of mono right so it's not it's not on the rig while i'm fishing but i can clip it on with the carabiner clip when the lead hits the rod tip and everything's going to go down together and this zeppelin's going to swing below the fish and we'll, we'll get into the zeppelin stuff here in a little bit and it'll get below the fish so it's not technically on not going to it's not going to help you with goliath groupers because they don't have that sensory but if you're in an area where sharks are a problem and you're fishing long leaders like this the only way that i can see to feasibly fish this zeppelin to prevent the sharks from uh depredating your fish is to have it be on like a six foot mono drop and it, you can clip it on when you're fighting your fish in the rod holder you just clip this carabiner clip on your main line with six foot of line and when everything hits the rod tip it's all going to slide down the rod together the bead the lead the carabiner clip and the zeppelin and when it all hits the swivel two feet in front of the fish it's going to stop and now the six foot leader is going to swing below the snapper and it's going to create this magnetic force field that they're deterring from below your fish so 
we'll get a little more into that rigging um, as, as I get into that, that section of talking. Um, but I usually, again, like to start with 80 pound leader when I'm mutton fishing um, and even mangrove snapper fishing for some of the bigger mangroves. We caught one that was 10 pounds the other day, uh, a couple days ago on 80 pound. Um, the, the one that we caught today was about six pounds, was on 80 pound, even though we weren't targeting them and ate a live bait. Um, and if we're not getting bites, I'll switch one rod to 50 pound and we get down as far as 30 pound. But uh, especially with targeting the mangroves and stuff like that, you can get down into that level, especially with the three, four and five pound mangroves. But you get a bite from a 10 pound mangrove on 40 pound on the bottom you're, or 30 pound on the bottom, most likely you're going to have a problem. And, and any quality size mutton, it, it's gonna take a lot of luck for him not to angle back towards the reef um, to cut you off. So uh, always start with heavier leader, I think would be the biggest takeaway for both the snapper fishing and grouper fishing. If you're not getting bites in an area, downsize your leader. Always try to have that one step higher advantage if that makes sense when you're bottom fishing, right? The fish know the structure you don't know exactly where you are or how everything lays if you don't dive. Um, I've fished areas long enough to know now when I get bites, if a fish rocks me up, I can go a certain direction and try to pull them out of the bottom with the boat if we're not anchored up. Um, and you know where the caves are and you know where the ledges are. If you dive, uh, getting a, any kind of better understanding of the bottom that you fish uh, is a huge advantage um, to yourself as an angler. When uh, when we anchor and, and, and fish any of the long leaders and stuff like that, or anchor for groupers or whatever we do, always try to anchor not directly on the structure, but in the sand away from it. One, so you don't, your leads don't stick in the bottom, but two, it may take a little longer to get a bite than when power fishing, because you're drawing the fish away from the reef, but when you do, you're at an advantage, right? Because um, they're out in the sand, they've got to run further and they've got to pull more drag to get back in the structure. Um, not always does that work because if you have to let a lot of anchor line out uh, while you're bottom fishing because of the current, the more anchor line you let out, the more you're going to swing. And when you swing, you're going to get close to the reef. Sometimes you can go up on top of it and get hung up. You're going to swing off of it. Um, so there's, there's variables involved with anchoring, but always try to anchor off the structure. If I'm fishing, a, fishing 50 foot liters, and I'm marking fish in a spot and my drift is 340 degrees when I test my drift out. Uh, I'm going to anchor, you're going to take 340 minus 180. That's going to be your heading that you're going to go away from your spot. You got a 50 foot leader. I want to be 50 feet away from my mark, right? So my leaders are going to go back or even a little further. And if you're, it's nice to have an angle to the drift in my opinion. Um, if you're, if you're laying you know, 10 degrees east or west of due north when you're anchored up or facing due south, but your, your lines are going due north. If you're 10 degrees off, it's nice because your stuff can kind of go into the reef at an angle and you can be off in the sand a little easier, which uh, seems to form for better fishing at times. Um, pretty typical for anchoring, I would say is two and a half to one with my boat on anchor line versus depth, but I've also anchored with 600 foot of rope and 90 foot of water or 75 foot of water. And I've got a, a, a plow anchor that works really well with 25 foot of chain. So the chain, the chain's really what helps dig the anchor in, right? And, uh, and keep it on the bottom. And if you miss your spot, you know, if you don't have a, a I see a lot of boats with trolling motors now, but if you miss your spot anchoring and, and you're not 100% dialed in on it, and I miss all the time, um, you do you just you just do like you can you can drift you can totally drift two times the same direction you anchor up and you lay entirely differently um, so I have a, uh, a safety line that's on my boat that I use for my dredge reel and my electric reels when we're bottom fishing with the electrics and it's pretty easy to create a bridle off the bow of the boat and by that I mean I, I just take my uh, the line off the bow through the chalk and the bow cleat and I lay this lazy line on my bow cleat and then I run the, the line over the anchor line and then back to the cleat. So now it comes off the side of the boat instead of right off the bow, four, five, six, eight, ten 10 feet, however much I need it to. 
and now instead of my boat laying straight into the current it's laying like this and it's steering one way or another and it gets you back in position and if you go a little bit too far then you just cinch it up a little bit and you come back so it, it kind of minimizes you having to pull the anchor a whole bunch of times so it's nice to have that uh I, it's like rocky always says from the safari it's a geometrical brain tease he's a lot smarter than i am too and it's uh you know anchoring up can be a challenge but also extremely productive especially for targeting the bigger snappers um, i wouldn't say it's imperative for good grouper fishing but for the bigger mangrove and mutton fishing definitely definitely need to anchor um, to have better fishing a lot of people ask me all the time about chumming snapper fishing and grouper fishing the only chum that goes over is when I make a plug bait and I throw the dorsal or the tail over or the head and the tail of a dinosaur, head and the tail of the uh, uh, sardine or whatever we're cutting up, throw them over. Uh, I try not to put any other chum in the water besides that because of the sharks. Um, you know, and, and, and the tails, I, we catch snappers all the time when there's mild enough current uh, where the tails will sink down or they come up in the water column and eat them they hit the deck and they spit the tail up or they spit a head of a greenie up or whatever the case may be they spit chicken wings up too if you like to eat chicken in your snapper fishing when you throw your bones over a lot something about the way they waffle down snappers love to eat chicken bones um, as well so it can kind of be a, a unique form of chum for you with the mutton fishing um, on the hook I have on here, it again is a 9174 Mustad Ultra Point. I'm going to pass these around just so you guys can take a look at them. Um, they didn't have uh, the 80 here, but a 70 would probably work as well. Um, and I use the 40 for the mangrove and mutton fishing. I also use it for chicken rig fishing. Um, I've never broken one of those hooks. Knock on wood. I have not broken one of those 4-0 hooks and we've caught 30 pound cobias, 20 pound groupers, double headers of amberjacks, uh, all kinds of stuff that you would think would, would break the hook. We've, we've caught big sharks on it that have eaten our fish on the chicken rig prior to incorporating the Zeppelin here lately. Uh, and they're an extremely strong hook. Um, I have had just like any other hook manufacturer and you always I always look at my hooks no fault to anybody it's just mass production in my opinion um, I have pulled hooks out that are missing the barbs or the points are broken so I mean anytime you're tying a hook on just try to be aware of what the hook looks like when you are bottom fishing if you snag bottom you know always check your hook point if you get your rig back because a lot of times your hook could be just in the bottom and it could bend the point over or dull it over so to me you know it's the simplest thing to do is just to retie and check your knots you want to stay on top of your leaders when you're when you're bottom fishing you know, anytime you pull in a long leader i always run it through my hand when i'm doing a bait check just to make sure that the line didn't get in the reef and we didn't know it when the boat was swinging or whatever and maybe it got chafed up especially with that lighter line of 30 40 50 pound um, and obviously after you catch fish or you you pull a fish off uh, on the heavier leaders always I always check them for uh, for chafe uh, and wear and tear. Um, chicken rig fishing, uh, probably a charter boat's best friend, really. Um, and a lot of people don't realize what you can catch on a chicken rig. But if you fish different baits on a chicken rig, you can catch all kinds of stuff. And I fish all my chicken rigs with 50 pound. Um, a chicken rig is just a two hook rig. Uh, with the four odds and we've got the surgeon's loop on the bottom to put the bank sinkers on it just goes right to a snap swivel you can see i really don't even care about my tag end when i'm tying stuff fast or in the heat of the moment it's really not important uh, for a quality bite we're sending this down you can set the hook all day long the guy who wants to set the hook on my boat gets a chicken rig because he gets to set the hook all day and the reason why is your lead is below your hooks so when you go to set the hook you're directly connecting to the fish right when you get a bite um, phenomenal for obviously sea bass, trigger fish, lane snapper, stuff like that. Um, typically uh, with the trigger fish, small pieces of squid and the jumbo bee liners are uh, going to be small pieces of squid, even squid tentacles, um, I'll just whatever, a, a, a piece of squid that's twice the size of the hook. And I'll hook it on there twice so it stays on well, send it down and let her rip. Um, for the big lane snappers, red groupers, scamp groupers, uh, and other snappers and stuff that we're catching 
Uh, I typically will fish a cut bait. I love to fish with cut herring. Um, the herring itself, uh, we'll cut it into three or four pieces and, and we'll fish the head as well at times, just not the tail. <clears throat> and uh, on a herring, uh, their belly line is got a hard spot, that little ridge that sometimes will feel like you're cutting your finger on. Uh, so we always hook through the belly, not through the back. The back meat is very soft and it'll pull off easily. And you can send this down. The biggest thing about the chicken rig fishing when you're looking for a bigger snapper or a grouper is let the grunts let everything else peck away at it, right? So uh, you're gonna send these chunks of meat down there and I, I call it like machine gun bites or vibration bites. Your rod's gonna go like this. And you wanna wait till that singular solid double tap. And when you get that, you respond to that with your hook set. And that's where we're, you know, when the big lanes are here and uh, areas where we catch red groupers when they show up in decent numbers, um, you know, that's, that's where you're a little more patient with the bigger piece of bait cut blue runner uh, and cut herring seem to work best um, in my opinion and, and bonita as well uh, with the bonita uh, when I side it out I'll, I'll take all the meat off except for maybe a half an inch of meat um, and then hook that on there uh, and just do I do little not strips but they're they're gonna be like if you could envision that being a square that would be on there and that would be your your bonita chunk right um, and that's about the size that I would cut a herring. Obviously, it's not going to be that tall from dorsal to ventral, but you can get four or five baits out of a, a single herring when you throw the tail away. Obviously, uh, if you're dropping a single hook rig, which is another setup here where we like to catch the mangroves with, um, you want to. It's very imperative to have those those belly hook rigs hooked in the center so it doesn't spin your rig up on the way down. This doesn't matter. I mean, obviously, you don't want to hook it you know all the way over on one side it kind of defeats the purpose but it, if it spins up a little bit on the way down it's going to unspin itself when it stops running down um and it, it's not that big of a deal so you know you can just hook it if this were the chunk here obviously you want to go right in the center and then it's got the heavy ridge on the bottom that'll help prevent it from getting pulled off as easy <clears throat> any questions up to this point guys yes sir you're using 80 pounds, you start with 80 pounds. Start with 80, yes sir. And on an average, you're running a 50 foot liter? 50 foot, yep. Okay. With mangroves, uh, uh, you know, a lot of the areas we catch uh, mangroves and muttons together, but mangroves will gather up for the spawn and kind of push the muttons out in some areas. And uh, we'll go with a shorter leader with doing that. You can get away with 12 or 15 foot. Um, on the bigger baits for the bigger ones uh, and then like I said if you have the right conditions this is another rig we'll use for mangrove fishing and this is just a, a, a short leader rig and you would just send your bait down and let it sit on the bottom you can fish a pilchard on here a sardine on here uh, or a piece of cut bait like we talked about um, sometimes if there's a little bit of current or depending on the scenario if we're having issues with the rig spinning up I'll take a herring cut the head and tail off and then cut right down the backbone and you just hook the hook in the in the tail end of the two pieces when you use it so you have a piece that's the belly and you have a piece that's the back and you go right through the center and out the tail section so the narrow end is going down first it's a more streamlined bait it's just like the same type of bait that you would fish on your long leader except you've shortened it up and I'll typically make it smaller so if I have a herring bait that's that long on the belly, I'll typically cut it back to be a little bit shorter. This is a kind of, we don't really want this to be a peck, peck, peck away type of bait for the mangroves like they'll do on the bigger baits. We want this to be one and done in my opinion. So I do, I do shorten up the bait a little bit. Um, nighttime, you can get the fish up in the water column. Uh, and, and some guys do really well with that chumming and then they you know drifting back live shrimp or little pieces of cup bait uh glass minnows and stuff almost like yellow tailing down in the keys minus the chum balls uh, and you can get them up in the water column but uh, in my experience the uh, early years of doing that uh has kind of turned into attracting a lot of blue runners and uh, other stuff um and so we've tried to stay away from it and just catch what we can with minimized chumming any questions all right, so let's let's talk about maybe trying to find spots. So, um, 
obviously Martin County is, uh, and in St. Lucie County for that matter, uh, we've got a great artificial reef program here. Uh, we catch a tremendous amount of quality bottom fish on all the public spots when we hop around. Uh, you know, just because they're high relief doesn't mean they're not going to hold good fish. I mean, high relief is going to get a lot more pressure, obviously. Public spots are going to get a lot more pressure. Um, but they're typically a lot bigger. And, uh, it, you know, you can look at, like, the Langford is like, acres of area of, of bottom, right? So fish can move all over that. They can be off of it. Um, you, you know, those are spots you can anchor up away and draw the fish to you because they're kind of snaggy areas. Uh, and there's there's some cabarrus and other stuff there that you can catch that are bigger, but um, all the all the public spots, in my opinion, hold fish and quality fish at you know certain times. Condition, very condition oriented bottom fishing is. Um, when we're trying to learn the lay of a public spot, really, it's just kind of become through trial and error, in my opinion. I mean, you you understand how a ship lays on the bottom. Um, you start to learn. The mass you start to learn on days you're on the east side if if your fish get into the structure more easily maybe there's a, a breach in the hull or or i don't know portholes or something there that they can sneak into or get you around into the pilot house of a tugboat or whatever the case may be uh and maybe that doesn't happen on the west side so you try to look for the advantages and, and piece the puzzles together through times and experience of fishing these areas in my opinion and you kind of you can just take notes and kind of map it out I mean, it's really easy to take notes on your phone uh i try not to use my phone too much during the day but i take a lot of notes on it in in the phone not only what we catch because now i have to report everything um but but also just how the bite was and the conditions were so i can log everything into my book at home um and if you if you get to a point where you're doing something like that and you're really into bottom fishing all that data is just going to start to compile itself and help you out and help you better understand from the surface what that bottom structure is like and we will see uh there's times where you know we go to high relief spots that are going to be pretty well prone to amber jacks and and, and uh, almaco jacks uh rudder fish at times bigger areas are, but when 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 you go to areas that have amber jacks and rudder fish and almaco jacks there that area is alive, right? You can go there 10 days in a row or over eight months and maybe you don't see anything. And then you go one day there and there's life there, start fishing because something has changed in that day you're there, right? I'm there, I'm out there every day. Not, I'm not, not saying we're going to the same spots every day, but if you're only fortunate enough to fish a couple times a month and you're trolling over these areas, looking for something to drop on, you don't see life, don't see life. And you go over the same stretch of the Wickstrom Reef for two months straight and then all of a sudden you go out there and one of the spots is lit up like a Christmas tree high and low start fishing uh, a lot of people you know frown on uh, the amber jacks but uh, I I started eating them when uh, I worked for Glenn Cameron on the Floridian I never ate an amber jack till he convinced me to do it in Fort Pierce 20 years ago and we brought it fresh up to the tiki original tiki place and it was hard to tell the difference between that and the group or fried except for the grain of meat and I know it's hard for a lot of people to believe but uh, it is very good obviously it's very good smoked uh, worms are a deterrent for people but the way I see it you can see them and you can cut them out so it's uh, it's not like you're gonna be eating them uh, most all fish have some kind of worm in them but uh, the rudder fish are very good excellent sashimi we, we bleed all those in the throat um, so when you're catching those rudder fish Instead of throwing them back, try them out. They're excellent fried and blackened. And then once once you catch a few of those fish, even if you're letting them go and you don't want to keep them or smoke them or whatever you want to do, uh, they'll stop biting eventually, and you're, you're going to get through them and get down. Uh, maybe what you try to do is uh, we catch a few amberjacks, and there's amberjacks there, but I feel like I'm marking groupers or snappers. What I'll do is I'll just pull further ahead, meaning to the south, uh, because I'm drifting naturally to the north, and get my baits below that, right? And so hopefully now they're on the bottom and the amberjacks don't see them or the jacks don't see them and free dive down. I can literally, people always ask, well, how do you know when to tell me to stop or when I'm gonna hit the bottom? I can see your bait going down on my bottom machine. I can see your lead hit the bottom. I can see the bait go down and I can see when stuff in high relief and, and most of you will be able to do it on your machine as well. You'll see a school of jacks marking here sitting above a wreck and you go to drop and all of a sudden the whole school will go like this. 
now you know your bait's in that zone. If you want to catch one, just stop it, right? No sense in going all the way to the bottom and fighting them further if you don't have to, right? So stop it where you see them, see them change their level in the water column, and then you just wait there for the bite. Now, it's funny with amberjacks, amberjacks can be a really subtle bite. We've caught 100 pound amberjacks. I've sent down two and three pound blue runners and the people go, this is a small fish. Said, it's not possible. You sent down a bait that was this big. A lot of times when they bite, if you went down through where they've been hanging out, they're hanging out in an area because they like the water temperature or whatever the case may be. They dive down and they kind of free dive down to eat your bait. A lot of times it's just a doink and then they start to swim back up, right? And you're, you know you got something on, it's heavier than your bait, but it's not really fighting. And that's where everybody's like, ah, it's not a very big fish. And then all of a sudden they hit that level where they're with their buddies and it's game on, right? So the whole entire platform changes and the attitude changes. Um, but it's it's something that you can, you can kind of figure out and see. Uh, you can control where you want to hook those fish when they're biting, right? So like I said, again, you don't have to go all the way to the bottom. If you want to bypass them, a lot of times what we'll do again is I'll move further to the south. I'll go another 150 or 200 feet further to the south. We'll get our baits down to the bottom, right? And sometimes if the water quality is good, they can see down there that you can see them swim down to bite. Other times you get by it and you get into a zone where you now you're no amberjacks, you've got good bait, you've drifted through the sand, you're getting to the structure and you get your grouper and your snapper bites. So there, there are ways to get around them, uh, and, and it doesn't work all the time, but uh, a lot of the times you can get just further away, and it's just going to take you a little bit longer. It's going to take you four or five minutes power fishing back to the north. Uh, and Okay, so power fishing real quick. We didn't touch base on this. Uh, just to give you a visualization, um, if, uh, if this is the structure here, and here's my boat, and the current is going to the north, right? I'm going to, depending on how strong the current is, I'm going to move my boat a certain distance south of the structure, right? That number is going to vary. You're just going to have to figure it out with your own. There's really no formula because I don't know what pound braid you're using. I don't know what lead you're going to use. You know, you can you can get down really quick with a 24 ounce lead and not go further south. But if you want to use a 10 ounce lead or if you have 65 pound braid versus 100 pound braid, or you're using mono. So there's a lot of variables involved. You'll just have to figure it out with your equipment, what you're using and what weight size you should use to maximize your time. But you're gonna go past the structure, you're gonna send your baits down, and then you're just gonna hold the boat into the current as you slowly slide to the north. So you're still sliding to the north, but you're just slowing the drift down instead of anchoring. Uh, you can get away with a lot lighter lead doing this type of fishing than you can anchoring. If I can do, if I, let's say I can power fish with two knots of current in 90 foot of water with 100 pound braid with 12 ounces of lead. If I anchor up, I've probably got to use a pound and a half. So you're bouncing along. You should be able to feel your lead skipping. So I tell my guys, you feel your lead skipping and I can see it in the rod tip too, but I always like people to get a feel for what's going on. So you feel your lead skipping? Yes, I do. If it stops, it's one of two things. You're either off the bottom or you're snagged. So I can see people get snagged before they know they're snagged because their rod stops skipping and it just slowly starts to bend. The easiest thing to do when you get snagged is just pop your rod up and down really aggressively. And a lot of times if it's just the lead, it's gonna pop right out. If it doesn't, kind of steam, sorry, for demonstration purposes, steam a little further south away. And if it got stuck like under a rock, most likely you can pull it out going to the south. But I would say seven out of 10 times, you start popping your rod holding down by that butt end and up by the foregrip and just really popping it aggressively, you're gonna pop that lead out, right? If you're not stuck and it stops skipping, you can let a little more line out. Is it imperative to be right on the bottom all the time? Absolutely not, because you're fishing 10 foot, 12 foot, 15 foot a liter, your bait's not there. So if your lead's a foot off the bottom, you can't say it's gonna make that big of a difference. However, for me, knowing where people's baits are because they're lacking feel from not doing it a lot, it's nice to be able to see the lead skip. It's nice, I can tell the difference between the skip and a bite. Um, and you can tell with the braid when your bait gets nervous. Again, when your bait starts to get nervous, we do what we talked about earlier. You can kind of slowly tease that bait up away from the bottom or your lead, right? Your bait's probably already away from the bottom, but slowly start to tease your lead up and just 
one or two really slow cranks and lifting away, that's 12 extra feet that you've given yourself an advantage. So when you're fishing areas that are high relief, like a wreck or a tug or something that maybe comes up seven, eight, 10 feet off the bottom, 15, 20 feet off the bottom, now you got to think too, if you're hooking anywhere near that high pinnacle of the relief and your bait was on the bottom, you don't have to come just 10 feet, you got to come 30 feet, right? To get, to get away from the structure. So, you know, I always try to tell people the first 30 or 40 feet is really important to try to grind out, uh, you know, depending on where we're fishing, but the high relief stuff, the tugs, mullifin, the Rankin, the, any of the Wickstrom stuff, the Halsey, the David T, any of that stuff, really got to work hard to get your bait away. Um, and that's, that's if you're skipping along on the top or really close to the side. If you go around and survey the area when you get there, or if you're trolling and you're surveying bottom, which I do all, all day long when I troll, I just connect the dots on bottom structure if we're not catching anything on the surface and I look for spots to drop. When I see an area that I want to drop on, I make a mental note. If I don't do it right there, I'll come back in a little while. But when I come back, I'm going to map that whole section of reef out. The first thing I'm going to do is look for fish that are out in the sand because that gives us a huge advantage if we can catch them there before they move in. If I start catching the fish close, then everything is going to scatter. That was a way they don't come in, right? So if I can pick away some fish that are out in the sand, everything's going to actually start to gravitate to the structure naturally. And then we're going to go and we'll be able to ping off another fish or two. So maybe you can catch four or five fish in a spot if they're groupers and then you leave and you let it rejuvenate itself over the couple of weeks. Um, so has anybody got, got any questions about power fishing? No? You guys are an easy crowd, either that or I'm not making any sense. I don't know. <laughs> yes, sir. Oh, okay. Um, as far as, uh, I didn't say it about with bait, but I will say this. I mean, I when I bottom fish, I like to have the widest variety of bait that I can have. Um, when I snapper fish, I like to start with dead bait in any way, shape, or form that I can when I'm anchored. Um, and it, the reason why is if you start with live bait, you're never gonna get bites on the dead bait. If I start with dead bait and they start to get used to that and they stop biting, ah, I can send down a sardine, guess what? I got a bite, I get them fired up again. Or you send down a herring or a, a something with its tail cut off or whatever the case may be, you start getting bites again you kind of trick them back into feeding and then you can slide another dead bait out. You know, snappers I don't mind when there's when there's hundreds of snappers in an area and they're spawning or aggregating versus eight or 10 groupers, sit there and catch your limit of 10, you know, or 20 or whatever it is that they're biting. If you're on a spot where there's, you're marking 10 or 15 groupers, you don't want to catch all 10. You know, you catch two or three or four, move on to another spot, let that spot rejuvenate. It's like a crab trap. If you leave a stun crab in your crab trap, more crabs will come back versus quicker. At least they did when I did it. Uh, they would come back quicker than if you empty the trap out and just put another can of cat food in there. Um, when we are bottom fishing, especially chicken rig fishing, one of the things you'll notice, uh, which our cobia season, for lack of a better term, was absolutely horrible this year uh, and continues to be horrible. And I think that's a lot, uh, directly attributed to all the dead loss from sharks the last two or three years. Uh, which just we have a lot of us have said the fishery wasn't sustainable. I think we're suffering that right now. Um, I always try to have a, a, a Cobia Slayer jig. I've been using these jigs probably 20 plus years. I think I was casting these back with VJ when I worked with him on the Bone Shaker. And uh, it's always been my favorite jig. I don't carry any other jig offshore for Cobia fishing than this jig. If I can catch jigs on Cobia, casting out a turtle or a ray uh, I'm going to use that all day long because I, I don't if I cast a bait a couple things will happen when it, inevitably you go to try to cast a bait really far what happens you cast it off right or hits the water and when there's a manta ray or a leatherback turtle there's typically remoras with it well what happens you catch how many times you catch a remora I can 100% say I've only caught in my lifetime one remora on a cobia slayer jig it's always been cobias. So when we're pitching at them or when we're anchored up bottom fishing or we're drift fishing and we're catching snappers, vermilion snappers, sea bass, uh, lane snappers, trigger fish, whatever with our chicken rigs, 
it's inevitable during peak season that somewhere somewhere along the line cobias are going to follow your chicken rig fish up so it's always good if you have an extra spinning rod to have it ready to go if you don't have an extra spinning rod fishing it with a snap swivel your chicken rig with a snap swivel and then just having these in your cup holder ready to go with say four foot a liter 50 pound with a perfection loop on it and that way when you get up there you can just quickly unclip your uh unclip your chicken rig and clip the jig on and sink it down and jig it back up one of the biggest things um with this type of jigging just like any other type of jigging uh that i see is um i've always tried to demonstrate this and it's very challenging to do but uh one of the biggest things that i always see people do is they either do a little like little jigs like this which to me is not doing anything or they do a big jig but then they just do like five or six cranks right so so many reels now are, are such high speed right this every time you turn this handle is 42 inches of line <clears throat> kobe is eat the jig on the fall so when you jig you want your jig to have a lot of aggressive movement to it but it's got to fall so when they bite it on the fall what has to happen your jig has to be really aggressive otherwise you're not going to set the hook in their gummy lips and their bony mouth for crushing crabs so when we cast out if we're just blind jigging or whatever the case may be i tell people we're on the sand pile cast out count to 30. so we have live baits out on one side of the boat somebody's casting a jig on the other side of the boat again we're trying to create a big footprint just like any type of fishing we're doing to cover area we're letting the jig sink down to cover water column when i cobia fish with live bait I fish three to four live baits. They've all got different size leads on them and they're all at different depths. Until we start getting a bite at a certain depth, then I'll start adding. So if I'm fishing a bait with a one ounce lead, a bait with a three ounce lead, uh, a bait with a, uh, depending on current, a bait with a, a six ounce lead. So I got a six ounce lead on the bottom, three ounce lead mid column, a one ounce lead is just a couple feet below the surface. Cobias mill around all the time. They go up, down, they go up, down with whatever they're following or if they're by themselves. So if you have these baits at different levels uh, and you get bites, yes, a lot of occasions you can get bites on all three rods. Sometimes there's only one rod that's getting bit. Well, after that happens two or three times, we're gonna start fishing two rods at that depth, right? And what I do is I'll spread those two rods out and fish the third rod in between them. So hopefully we can start getting fish to bite at all three rods, right? Try to maximize that. So the guy's cast his jig out. When he's jigging back, he's gonna do a really aggressive jig. And then one or two, one or, one or two cranks down. And when you're jigging, when you crank down, you don't wanna crank all the slack up. So you're dropping your tip and cranking, but only one or two cranks, and you still have slack in your line. If you're cranking to where you're tight, and the jig's kinda of just starting to move flat or straight, that's going to be no good. So you want this jig going up, down, up, down, all the way back to the boat. If you get thumped, you're going to get thumped when you're setting the hook and or jigging again. So you're technically setting the hook, right? If you have cobias follow you all the way to the boat, there's two things you can do. To me, the more effective thing is to just open your bail and let the jig fall and they'll chase it down. And as soon as you stop it, usually one hits it on the way down and you're instantly hooked up. The other thing that can work if you don't want to drop out of your out of your sight is just move your rod in a quick figure eight a couple times and a lot of times a fish will eat it. Typically there's more than one so there is a level of competition involved um, when they follow your, your rig up to the boat. So having this ready while you're chicken rig fishing is, uh, is vital. Having it ready when you're trolling in case you see a, a leatherback turtle or a manta ray or if you see a couple free swimmers on a weed line or a a uh, dirty green to green change or something in 60 foot, 70 foot of water. Always good to have. When we do our uh, our blind jigging on wrecks where I feel like we're marking them or we're just scoping an area out, I'll typically use the three ounce. When we're fishing anywhere else, I'll typically use the two ounce. Um, I fish with the pink and white. I do, I do carry chartreuse too. Uh, I love the pink in the green water. I love the white in the blue water. And there are times where you're doing a lot of cobia fishing and they're only biting one color. Have multiple colors if you're gonna carry them just because you can throw a jig and they'll follow it and not eat it and you change the color. And as soon as it hits the water, you're getting bit. I've seen it happen countless, countless times. 
uh, easy to have in your box, easy to have rigged up and ready to roll. <clears throat> you can buy spare tails for them. And uh, it's just nice to have those bonus fish anytime that they, uh, they appear. All right. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about this device here that I was introduced to, I guess, maybe six weeks ago. Uh, it's called the Zeppelin. It's made by a company called Shark Bands. They make, um, or they started their company making shark bands, literally for people's wrists and ankles for diving. Um, they've started this technology, which is magnetic technology. It's uh, it's live all the time. There's no on-off switch or anything like that. I probably wouldn't use it if you have a pacemaker and you don't want to put it near your phone. Um, but uh, I was, I, I'll just be pointing out, just gonna be frank with you, I was very skeptical <laughs> at first and I'm not part owner or anything like that. I'm just trying to protect my, li my livelihood. Um, the guys came and fished with me a couple days last last month I guess it was and uh, they were telling me that you know oh it's got to be three feet below the tail of the fish that you're catching and of course we're having a big problem with sharks eating sailfish mahis tunas there's four charter boats um, and of course sailfish season is wound down but there's four charter boats between here and Palm Beach that we've we've seen 88 sails between the four of us get eaten seen them get eaten uh, since January 1st and that's that's not including post-release mortality, which which um, some of us, including uh, members of councils and, and maybe even the Billfish Foundation, think it could be up to 40 or 50 percent. So that's a scary number when you think about that for a species that's never really been targeted. I mean, the only thing that should naturally catch a sail in its environment is a mako. A sail is the fastest fish in the ocean. Uh, the shark is the mako shark is faster. It's the fastest creature in the ocean. Um, so in a natural environment, that should really be the only thing that, that eats it. Last year, uh, I was pre-fishing, I guess it was two years ago now, uh, down south uh, for sailfish tournaments. And we had, a, we had a, a fish coming up to eat a kite bait and it was eaten by sharks before it engaged the bait. So there's a lot of pack feeding going on. I'm sure if you fish at all here or Jupiter or Palm Beach in recent years, you've had shark interactions. Um, this I can't really, we haven't really come up with a way, I sh sh shouldn't say it can't help, I, we haven't come up with a way, I haven't personally seen a way where this, that weighs six and a half ounces is going to help you prevent a, a sail or a dolphin from being eaten because fish that are jumping and you slide this on your 20 pound line and it makes a change in direction, it's probably going to break your line, right? So people don't want, are not going to want to take that risk. Um, we started using it bottom fishing and the guys uh, from Zeppelin came. Uh, I, I, like I said, flat out honest with you, I didn't really comprehend how it could be rigged. Um, when I was told it needed to be three feet below the tail of your fish and I'm fishing uh, you know, a three-way swivel with a 10-foot leader and I'm thinking I gotta use this as part as my lead, right? It's, I've just started using it as part as my rig. So now my lead drop on my three-way swivel was 15 feet instead of 15 inches, right? So what happens, you run the risk of losing this in the bottom, getting snagged or breaking off. Uh, the two days that we fished here, we didn't have a whole lot of current. And when we were sending baits down, they were kind of spinning up. Um, and then we, we went to a spot where I knew sharks were a problem and we, we dropped with the Zeppelins and we weren't getting bit. And I'm like, well, okay, maybe there's not sharks here. I don't really understand. I feel like I'm marking them. We looked at the cameras, there's sharks swimming around and they're not eating the fish. That was an eye opener for me because I've, I've personally felt like when I've gone to areas where I haven't had shark interactions, they just weren't there. It's not the case now in the video. It's they're there, they're just not eating. So we took the Zeppelins off and we dropped and we caught fish without interaction. We went to another spot and we didn't have the Zeppelins on. And the first drop, we hooked a pair of amberjacks and one of them got eaten by a shark. Okay, now we know that sharks are hungry. We put the Zeppelins on, we dropped down, we caught one fish without it, or one fish with it, whole, another fish got eaten by a shark. Skepticism went through the roof, just to be flat out honest with you. Uh, and then I was, the guys are like, you rigged it wrong. And I'm looking at Egg Killer and I'm, I'm like, okay. So 
they explained it to me. They said, look, your, your drop wasn't far enough past the tail of the fish. So when the sharks came up, their instinct overrode when they got a, a bite of the fish. So it was kind of laying along the side of the fish, if that makes sense. It was too late. All right, so we re-rigged it. And for the rest of that day and the next day, we had, so we had 12 more depredation events and 11 of them were without the Zeppelin. One was with the Zeppelin and we caught close to 40 fish side by side with the, with the Zeppelin that were not eaten over the next course of the next day. And I don't know if anybody follows us on social media, but I shared some of the videos. And one of the things that was another scary eye opener to me was it wasn't one or two sharks. Like, okay, if they eat one or two fish, they're going to get full and leave. It was 12, 15, 20 sharks pack feeding on our fish. So that was an eye opener to me that the problem is greater than I realized. And the effort that we've been trying to put in with a bunch of people over the last year really needs to continue to grow for awareness because fish are being lost at an alarming number. Um, you know, if you're fortunate enough to get a fish up, but then again, it's too short bottom fishing or the season's closed and then it's got to swim back down. Pretty good chance if there's sharks there and he's coming back down slow, he might get eaten if you just got lucky in getting him up. So the, the, the dead loss factor uh, is kind of a potentially scary number with a, a lot of this. So over the course of the next month up till this point, uh, I started incorporating the Zeppelin, especially when grouper season opened. Um, and I lost a couple of them rigging it the way I was rigging. So I said, there's got to be a better mousetrap. Uh, brainstormed it for quite a while and decided, actually I was talking about using it for tuna fishing and came up with an idea for tuna fishing and decided I should incorporate it. I'm talking out loud and have a solution for my bottom fishing, but I was thinking about tuna fishing. So what we've done now is we're just taking a carabiner clip and we're tying monofilament to the carabiner clip and then the mono to the Zeppelin, which is six and a half ounces. If we're fishing a 10 foot leader, the way you want to rig this up is you take your average sized fish that you think you're going to catch. If let's say it's 30 inches or 36 inches, three feet, right? Amberjack's got to be 28, groupers have got to be 24. If you catch a, a nice grouper, you want to say he's three feet long, right? A cobia, 33 inches. So I am now going with a rule of thumb of if I have a 10 foot leader, I have a three foot fish that's 13 feet and this has got to be three feet behind it. This line is now 16 feet long. I leave this in my rod holder and this is sitting on my cooler, my bait cooler right by my rod holder. Find a spot that it works for you. When my guys get a bite, the first thing I do is run and throw this in the water to get it sinking. And I tell the guys keep cranking but back up and I just take this and hit it against the line and there's so much tension it just opens it and I let it go. It slides down yeah, let me just tie a quick piece of mono on here so I can demonstrate it. It slides down over the three-way swivel and catches on the bank sinker and once it stops now this is swung below your now this is swung below your fish. And I will say that the guys asked me when we got done testing what I would be actually Ed Killer I think asked me, he said, What would you be happy with saving fish? I said twenty five percent. I'd say we're probably close to eighty percent. And the number of fish that we've caught where sharks have followed this up. We've seen the sharks, we know sharks are in the area and I'm getting this on and it's working. So I have a fish on, I'm cranking up, I clip this on here, I don't have tension. Oh, there you go. I have a big fish on, looks like a yellow jack. <laughs> and uh, so the angler's fighting, I just lean over and clip it on, and of course it slides down to the fish, it catches on the bank sinker, and then swings below. Obviously I, I made it short for demonstration purposes to work, but you would want that longer than your fish and longer than your hook. So 10 foot leader, 16 foot drop on your Zeppelin. I've had two occasions where this didn't work, actually three. Out of all the fish that we've caught in the last month using this, 
the first scenario, we caught a nice black grouper, probably 16 or 18 pounds. A shark followed it up. We went back, made another drift. It was pretty rough. It was probably four to six foot. And we had worked really hard to get some bites. And I, the guys got hooked up. I ran back, of course left the boat. And as soon as I did that, the boat turned sideways in the wind. I threw the Zeppelin over and I clipped it on. And I look and the carabiner clips like, I can see it. It was stuck to my trim tab. The, it's such a powerful magnet. The boat like rocked and it caught, it like sucked up to the bottom of the boat. We got eaten by a shark. I didn't know what happened until we cranked the rig all the way up and it, the carabiner clip comes out of the water and it's slack and I pulling and it came off the bottom of the boat. It was stuck to my running gear. <clears throat> we were fishing another area uh, in 195 foot. Uh, maybe a week or 10 days ago and we we had really good grouper fishing but we had our biggest grouper of the day get eaten by a shark but we got back 65 percent 70 percent of it the previous drift we had four anglers fishing and we had light current and when we have light current i just let the boat lay side two fish two people in the bow two people in the stern we had hooked three banded rudder fish at the same time the first guy that hooked up got the Zeppelin and went down. And then I realized what we were dealing with, so I didn't hook the other ones on. Well, everything got tangled. All the, the fish coming up together, they all kind of swam together. I went and untangled everything, but when I did that, I clipped back leaders. I clipped back this, because this is on different mono than everything else, so I can tell what it is. And when I retied it, I didn't, I didn't put it back the way it should be. It was 100% my fault. The next drift, uh, the young lady hooked a, a really nice grouper. I clipped it on, threw it down, and it got eaten. And when we pulled it in the boat, you could see that next to the fish that was eaten, this was only hanging right at the tail. So 100% my fault. Since then, and the rest of that day, we had nine, we caught, I think, three or four more really nice gags. And everywhere we went, sharks followed them up. But what I did was after that event, I sat down and I told everybody, because everybody's, they're learning too. They're skeptical about it. They fish up north and everybody wants to try it because we're having problems everywhere. As I was frustrated and I said, I'm, all right, I'm gonna go back. I'm gonna retie everybody's leader, make sure everybody's leader is the same length. And we just took time. I took 10 minutes, I redid everything. I measured everything. I, I just do it with arm lengths, but, I, and just recalibrated. And next, if we got tangled again or anything happened, it was important enough after they saw it work a few times that we were okay because why rush through it and lose the fish when you could take a few minutes, retie, and be successful in catching your fish. So uh, again, super, super impressed. Uh, I think using this method uh, minimizes your loss because you're not using it as a lead, right? I'm trying to get them to come up with another skew that's maybe 12 ounces um, or maybe even a redesign uh, I did lose one to a kingfish. Okay, this is the way this is. If you hold it, it's equal weight. So when it goes down, even though it does sink, it kind of waffles, right? It's not leaded on one side. Um, and after I, 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 part of me being, I guess, lazy still, uh, I've told myself that I'm going to zip tie a lead, like another bank sinker, a four ounce, eight ounce, something like that, just to make it more streamlined to get down faster. And I, I haven't done it, but we haven't had another issue. And when, when I threw this over, <clears throat> I had this 16 foot leader or whatever, and it it was cut off clean, like with eight foot a leader. So the only thing I could think was this was all going down, you know, like this and the slack and the king ate it and clipped the leader off is what I attributed to. Um, but I, I do think you'll, you'll minimize that risk if you zip tie another lead to the bottom and make it more hydrodynamic, for lack of a better word, um, where it goes straight down like that. And if you're fishing deeper water or a lot of current, you're gonna want it to go down faster, right? So we, I haven't really gotten to that point uh, here the last few days. We used it uh, a bunch today. Uh, we did not have any depredation events. Um, I felt like I marked a few sharks, but I didn't see any, follow any of our fish up. So, you know, maybe it was just the conditions or Maybe they weren't hungry like I saw on the video on the camera the day that we uh, we tested because I do feel like I saw some of them swimming in the in the upper water column. 
uh, around where we were fishing, um, but we didn't have any issues. But if you're going to get into bottom fishing, uh, you know, I, I would, I would give it a shot. Uh, in all honesty, um, I know they're giving a one, giving one away here tonight. Uh, I believe. I'm not sure how that's getting done, but uh, I, I would say it's, 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 it's a game changer for for bottom fishing especially with this style rig now uh with a chicken rig with the right conditions to me it seems pretty ideal to use it as a lead right thus though you run the risk of losing it you get hung in the bottom and it, at a at a price point of 75 bucks it's a you know it's hard enough to lose five dollar leads all day so, you know, if, you, if you've been bottom fishing, you're going to snag bottom all the time. You know, it's just like if you go kite fishing, you're going to put kites in the water. It's just kind of the nature of the nature of the business and the nature of the style of fishing. So I think finding a way um, to incorporate it. And I, I ha honestly, I haven't found a way to do it with a chicken rig where it's not going to slide down to the hook and potentially de-hook a fish on top. Maybe using a smaller device or a smaller clip and having some kind of cork or something here where it could slide down, but then again, that would slow it down. Um, so th there's ways to fidget and play with it. Uh, I, I feel like most fishermen and fisherwomen are pretty uh, inventive to the needs, and, and this seems to, uh, we have a need, we have a problem, and, and this is not gonna solve the imbalance in the ecosystem that we have with the number of sharks here, but this is a, uh, a, a really creative device that, uh, it, you know, is at least giving us an opportunity to catch some fish or put more fish in the box. Uh, it's not going to do anything for post-release mortality. Um, and, you know, if you're fishing four people and, and you're buying one, you know, you're going to still lose fish. Obviously, if you hook two or three fish at the same time. But, uh, you know, hopefully, if you if you do decide to use it, you'll start to see that you can uh, you can catch a few more fish on the bottom with it. You had a question? So, when you're mutton fishing, you got that on a 50 Leader. No, sir. So if we, if you remember when I was talking about the leader, so if, if I start to have problems with Goliath groupers or sharks mutton fishing with the long leader, I go to the breakaway sliding lead, right? I, I think I, uh, Alex. Alex. Was Alex here? Hey, do you, uh, do you have any spros? You got, no, you got I, a understand, spros I understand that leader and the spros with the rubber Okay, band. so so what I would so what you're I would do. You're using 16 foot on a 10 foot leader right. for the group. Right. Understood. But what you're doing is when when your lead hits the surface and it breaks away, you're making your 50 foot leader two foot because it's all going to slide down and okay. stop at two okay. foot. I, I get so it. as your angler is cranking up in the rod holder on your nice mutton, then you, only need that you clip feet you long. clip this on. You only need it five or six feet long, right? And it's going to slide down with the lead. And everything that, else that okay. and then when it hits the bead and the, the the bead hits the swivel the bank sinker hits the bead then the carabiners clip hits the bank sinker and then it all swings below the fish okay. and that's gonna stop a couple feet in front of your in front of your bait so that's that's how that rig would work okay. um, and uh, so. uh, any other questions guys how are we looking on time Am I supposed to keep talking? <laughs> um, all right, we'll, we'll touch base on one more thing. I guess really I didn't talk about and I think about it. If there's anything else that you think of that you, you want to talk about, but um, obviously we have, we, we did talk a little bit about public spots, obviously on charts. I do a lot of trolling. A lot of areas that we do fish um, can be productive for trigger fish. They could be productive for 40 pound groupers. Um, when we're trolling, I'm always trolling with one of my bottom machines in Zoom um, and one of them on widescreen. Now the Zoom still shows a widescreen feature, but if it's only about this wide on, on my split screen in front of me. So if I'm trolling and I mark a sail, but I don't see it because I'm the main part of the screen is on Zoom for bottom, I've got my other display that's from zero to 100 foot or whatever depth of water. It's from the surface to the bottom. So if I mark bait, if I mark tunas, if I mark a sail, if I mark kingfish, I can see that on my other machine when I look back at it. When I'm trolling, I'm, I'm constantly looking at for bottom spots. And I, I tell you what, I mean, it's crazy with the technology now how many more spots I'm finding because I can see something going off my screen out of the corner of my eye, 
I can stop the machine, scroll back, and save a waypoint. Uh, I've, I mean, the number of spots that I've found in the last year since I put the new stuff on is incredible to the point where I haven't even had time to fish a lot of them. Um, but one thing about really quality spots, you'll find out small relief spots that are maybe three to five foot off the bottom. If you're driving around and your screen is from zero to the bottom, from the surface to the bottom, you're not gonna see a four or five foot piece of relief. And the fuzz that you see that might be green and the bottom is dark red uh, will look like nothing. But when you zoom it in, you see the green fuzz, it's a three foot, four foot ledge. And then there's two big red dots or Pac-Man looking ghosts. And those are groupers on my machine. And uh, like, okay, you hit save and then you tic tac around the area and you find that the ledge runs this way or what, and you have a whole new area to fish. One thing you're gonna learn too, thanks to tropical storms and hurricanes and everything else that we deal with here in Florida, nor'easters and stuff like that, whenever we get a big swell, new spots get uncovered and old spots get covered up. So those spots that are three or four foot tall, sand may fill them in one day or fill in the ledge, even though there's still a little relief there and you stop marking fish there, but a mile away, another spot's been uncovered and there's fish there. So you're bottom is constantly changing especially after we have a swell so if you want to look for spots I'd recommend you know driving around and and trying to focus on your bottom machine and fish it in a zoom I typically fish uh, the bottom 15 feet right if I if I'm out at the hill or I'm in deep water I'll do 30 foot but inside a 200 foot I'll fish it at a 15 foot zoom so I'm looking at the bottom 15 feet of the ocean floor you can see if a three or four or five six foot contour is going to jump out at you like a like a, a, a lit christmas tree it's just going to stand out really well if you see speaking of christmas trees i mean if you see a stack that looks like a christmas tree it's going to be an area that, that are snappers um, also the big individual snappers on my machine mark like vertical red slashes uh, then i said that like the groupers mark like pac-man ghosts or, or little round red balls and then when they start to swim they actually look like a like an upside down swoosh or check mark and you'll see them sitting in a spot and then they start to move and they like worm and turn green along the bottom where the echo kind of changes as they move um, so you can start to once you start to figure out what your machine looks like and you drop in an area and you catch something you say oh i marked this it must have been a grouper i marked this it must have been a snapper and then when you're traveling around looking for new spots you find out what's what pretty easily just by looking at it that comes with a little bit of trial and error. All the machines are different, but a lot of them are very similar as well. Um, we have Raymarine stuff on the boat and the Garmin stuff that I've used on the big boats were all very similar. Uh, I haven't played with Furuna or Simrad stuff, but most of the machines in the last three or four years all have the scroll back feature uh, on the bottom machines where you can scroll back and save your spot. You can zoom in on the spot, you know, even if you're fishing with it, zoomed out if you only have one screen and you're trolling looking for bait to catch mice or looking for tunas or whatever and you mark something you think is you can scroll back and then zoom in while it's paused and see if it's something you want to save you know and each and every one of those spots you bottom fish on um, the higher the relief is the, the better it's going to be for pelagics but there's a lot of spots that are go-to spots for me during tournament and time and stuff like that during the winter to catch sails that while I've been anchored up or while I've been grouper fishing, I've caught sardines there in 130 foot. Or it's, There's just something about that bottom that has different types of bait there and, and you can continuously catch a sail while you're at anchor. And that, that only is gonna happen so many times when I know that I can go there during the winter time when they're here and there can be some fish there. So you can start to piece all those pieces of the puzzle together. Um, like I did say with trolling with me, uh, like yesterday, there was really no surface condition. Uh, we started out kite fishing yesterday. We caught one out of a couple sails pretty quick and then ahead of a bonita because a porpoise ate it. And then the wind fell out and I went trolling. There was no surface condition. I knew the guys wanted to bottom fish, so I just started to connect the dots, you know, from 70 foot to 180 foot, just driving over bottom, making a circle, looking for jacks, looking for life. Uh, and then once we found areas where there was some life, we, we switched over and went bottom fishing. So it's, uh, it's all part of the puzzles to put together every day. And I think if you implore some of those tactics, finding spots, it'll make you a better bottom fisherman in the long run. 
Um, as far as conditions are concerned, we, we did talk a little bit about not knowing what's going on in the bottom, feeling the lead. You know, you can crank your lead up and feel if it's ice cold or cold when you get up to the top. Uh, a lot of times when the bottom's cold, fish are going to be lethargic, so maybe anchoring up and using a cup bait as opposed to a live bait, you would be more likely to get a bite as opposed to drifting by at a quick pace. Um, when we get south tide on the bottom, south tide is usually uh, coincides with cold water and also dirty water. Um, a lot of times the fish will bite really good on the first day of that and on the second or third day it's shut down. If it's an extended period of time, the fish vacate, uh, move to deeper water and stuff like that. Um, groupers can, can handle cold pretty well. I mean, you can catch a grouper and throw him in your fish box and he can be alive in your box on ice, you know, a couple hours later still breathing. His metabolism slows way down. Uh, that being said, a good, a good thing to do would be to anchor up. Uh, if you feel like your leads are cold but you're marking fish and try, try plug baits or dead baits as opposed to a live bait, something that they can just go over and it's not gonna run away from them. Um, and if you have cold water again, with, with south tide, it's usually associated with dirty water. Uh, and so having something that has scent, like a plug bait uh, versus a live bait that doesn't have scent and would be hard to find on vibration would be a better option as well. So. Any questions? No, you guys are an easy crowd. All right, well, I appreciate everybody coming. Hopefully you got some knowledge to take home with you and I think they're gonna do a giveaway.